Good evening, everyone. We want to welcome all of our members and our family members of the Friends of the IDF to what is going to be a very powerful, cathartic experience in this month's edition of FIIDF Live. We're going to be meeting with Rena Quint. And before we get to Rena, just to give a little background that many of you are familiar with. We're in our 42nd year as Friends of the IDF. Who started this organization? It was a group of Polish Jewish survivors, people who maybe were the only member of their family, maybe one of two or three members of their town that survived. As all of you know, that between 1939 and 1945, of the three million Polish Jews that stayed in German-occupied Poland, at most of those three million Jews, at most 35,000 survived. So you're talking about 1%. These men and women, rebuilt their lives, had a desire to rebuild the Jewish people and the Jewish world, not only in, as individuals, in terms of their families, not only in terms of their communities, which they played a profound role in building, but they saw something that they felt was the ultimate Jewish future. And that, of course, was the return of our people after 2,000 years, after two millennia as refugees to our homeland. And the only way that we could reestablish Israel, Medinat Yisrael, Eretz Yisrael, is if we could protect ourselves. If God would give us the ability to look after and protect ourselves, so the vulnerability that they firsthand experienced when everyone in their family, everyone in their community, everyone they knew was annihilated and wiped out, we need to look after these young men and women. The young men and women that we call the soldiers of the IDF. And they started this organization working in hand in hand with the general staff, with the Ministry of Defense. Ultimately, it's this organization that provides the transformational educational solutions, the welfare, the spiritual programming, the cultural programming for the men and women of the IDF. And they have created a world which is not just about providing for the soldiers in Israel, but one of the programs that we fund and provide over the last number of decades is a program called Witnesses in Uniform. And that Witnesses in Uniform manifests itself in many ways. The officers go to the home of Rena Quint. They hear, they listen, they learn her story. And for them, and they in turn for their soldiers, they can contextualize. They can frame the reason that they're asking these young men and women to give three, six, eight years of their life to dedicate to defending their people and defending the Jewish world. Witnesses in uniform many years takes officers to Poland and they relive and re-experience 1,000 years of Ashkenazic Jewish history and the six years of the Shoah. And it's with this depth, this context, and this perspective that these officers shape the future, not only of the IDF, but they shape the future of Israel. They give young men and women a reason, a context, and a purpose for why they're doing what they're doing. Tonight, we're going to meet one of the most special human beings, one of the most fascinating Jews that we could ever meet. And that is a woman by the name of Rena Quint. And we'll have a chance to experience what the officers and what the soldiers of the IDF do when they encounter this incredible woman. Hello everyone, and welcome to this edition of FIDF Live, Zikaron Basalon, or Memories in the Living Room. Today we are lucky enough to be hosted by Rena Quint in her living room in Jerusalem, Israel. And we have with us soldiers from a number of units of the IDF. My name is Cheryl Silver Ochayon. I'm happy to be here with you. Together we are going to listen to Rena as she gives us her testimony about the Holocaust. Rena? Hello, everybody. My name is Rena Quint, and I am really delighted, very, very pleased and honored to have the IDF come to visit us and to listen to my story. Um, I live in this wonderful apartment in Jerusalem and feel so good about having these soldiers protecting our wonderful country. And thank you, friends of the IDF, 
for helping us help the soldiers. You may remember Rena because she actually had the honor of speaking to President Joe Biden when he visited Yad Vashem in July of 2022. We're going to begin now with a poem that was written by Chana Senesh. Chana Senesh was an Israeli parachutist, poet, and heroine who was dropped into Europe during World War II. Unfortunately, she was caught by the Nazis, tortured, and finally killed. Chana Senesh wrote a poem called A Walk to Caesarea, or Caesarea, in which she describes the little things in life, and she prays. Thank you to the IDF Ensemble. Rena, let's start your story. Can you tell us how was your childhood different from all the other children in the Holocaust? First of all, a million and a half Jewish were, children were killed for no other reason that they were Jewish children, and I survived. Different from one and a half million children. How I survived, I don't know. My story is different because most children who did survive were so in Christian homes and hiding on false papers in convents and nunneries. That wasn't me. I was in a ghetto, a slave labor camp, various concentration camps. I was liberated from Bergen-Belsen, then sent to a displaced persons camp in Sweden, finally brought to America and adopted by wonderful American Jewish parents. And then my story is different because it has a happy ending. I came to live with my husband and four children in Israel, and we had 22 grandchildren, and as of now, we have 43 great-grandchildren. And that makes me very lucky and very gifted. Tell us where you were born. I was born in a city called Piotrkov in Poland. Piotrkov had a distinction of being the first ghetto when the Nazis came in, the first place that they came into was Pietrukov, September 1st, 1939. And soon after they arrived, 
there was bombing and there was shelling and there were tanks coming in. The German ready, army was ready with tanks, with, with guns, with proper boots. The Polish army was not ready. Um, they came in and they put a barbed wire fence around the Jewish section where we lived. That became the ghetto. Shortly after that, people in surrounding neighborhoods were not left to live there, so they had to move into the ghetto. And shortly after that, people in surrounding towns and villages, Stettler couldn't live there. So think of your apartments, no matter where you live and how you live, if you have four and five and six families moving in. It got very crowded. There wasn't enough food and people were starving. There wasn't enough medicine. People were getting sick. The weather was very cold. There wasn't enough heat. It was very, very bad. Early on, they took my father off, my father and my uncle, to a slave labor factory. You were lucky if you were taken to work because there were all kinds of rumors spreading about the Germans that they were gassing people and shooting people and throwing babies around. This couldn't happen to German people. After all, they were civilized, educated. Educated people wouldn't do things like that. Unfortunately, we found out all those rumors were true. My father was taken away to a slave labor factory. Who else was in your family? I remained in the house with my mother and my two brothers, David and Yessi. I did a lot of research. Um, in 1989, I went back to Poland and I found amazing things. Um, I found, first of all, that my mother came from a wealthy home, apparently, so I found a prenuptial agreement. When they were married, she went to a lawyer and she wrote all the things she had. She had furniture and she had bedding and she had jewelry and, and she had uh, money. My father didn't have anything like that. So in the ghetto, she was able to use her money or jewelry to get us bread. But shortly after, when the ghetto started, they took all the important people, the, all the workers out. And one night there was a banging down at the door and Germans came in and said, Rouse, Rouse, Schnell, you've got five minutes to pack up whatever you need and get out of your house. What could you take in five minutes where you're going to leave your house forever? I guess the most important things that people should take would be food or, or warm clothing because you're going to be, you don't know where you're going to be. Or maybe if you have money and jewelry that you could trade it for something else. People packed up whatever they did and we had to run down these terrible stairs and people fell, people, there was pandemonium, until we got to a very big square, Platz Tremonowski, it's called. 2,000 people had been taken out of the ghetto. There were more people waiting, but 2,000. And from this, from this big square, they beat us, and like animals, we were chased until we got into the um, synagogue. Synagogue, the Wade Synagogue, of Rabbi Lau, his grandson is the chief rabbi of Israel right now, the grandfather of the chief rabbi. He was the rabbi in, in the synagogue. 2,000 people couldn't get into the synagogue. As many as they could, they shoved into this beautiful place. And it's still standing, by the way, because it wasn't badly demolished, and you can still see a Jewish star outside. And, but it, there are no Jews left, not one. So they made it into a library. But we were brought into this big synagogue, and the people who couldn't get into the synagogue were taken out into the forest. They had to dig their own ditches, and they were shot into the graves that they built for themselves. I was in this big room with my mother and my brothers. At this point, I'm six. I was three and a half when the war started. Now I am six, and my brother's like eight and nine and a half. There was pandemonium, there was chaos, there was shooting. In back of the synagogue, which is now a library, there's a door. In back of that door, there was a man. I'm not quite sure who he was, but I think he was my uncle or someone I called uncle. My name was Fredja, Fredel in Yiddish, and he beckoned to me and he said, run, run. Why would I run when people are being shot and people were beaten over the head? Why would my mother let me run? I think I must have been holding on tightly to her. I don't remember exactly. 
I think she must have been holding on lightly to me. I don't know how it happened. Maybe she pushed me. Maybe God pushed me. I ran out. They could have easily shot me. When you go to Pietrakov now, you can see the remnants where there's a, a, a painting of the Ten Commandments and there's holes, bullets in there. They took everything out of the ark. They threw out the Torah. They threw out prayer books. They threw out Bibles. Uh, they made people clean up because there were no bathrooms there from the talais and the prayer shows that were there. there was, it was a terrible, terrible sight. I ran out. That was the last time I saw my mother and my brothers and the rest of that, my whole family and neighbors. They were all put onto those cattle cars and taken to Treblinka. I hope my mother's looking down here at this beautiful group of soldiers coming to my apartment in Jerusalem. I hope she's looking down to see that at least I have continued on her and my grandchildren have names of my mother and my father and my brothers, and we have continued. The man who was standing behind who you ran to, standing behind the door who you ran to, what happened afterwards? This man, what was she going to do? Girls were useless. I was a six-year-old little girl. Boys over the age of 10 could work. This man took me to my father, who was working in a slave labor factory, a glass factory called the Hordensia. My father was very happy to see me. He hugged me. He kissed me. The men helped me. People always, always helped me. To this day, people always help me. They tried to help me behind the ovens. In the glass factory, there are ovens of how they make the glass. And they needed people to bring water. They used boys to bring water so they put the molten glass in, in to cool. Um, my father said, I couldn't stay there as a little girl because this was a man's camp. From now on, you're not a little girl. You're not six years old. Your name isn't Fredja. You're a boy. You're a boy. You're 10 years old. Your name is Freud. Remember, say it. I'm a boy. My name is Freud. I'm 10 years old. You have to remember that to keep alive. When sometimes things have to happen, happen like that, my father said it was very, very important. I remembered I was a boy, and I worked with the men. I became a man, really, because I worked. They had big German shepherd dogs in that factory. And the soldiers, the German soldiers, every time they wanted to have some fun, they would sick a dog on you like that. And if that dog took a bite of somebody, if they couldn't lift their arm, they would shoot you. There were always people to replace you. And if got infected, too bad. They would shoot you. A lot of people could take your place. The fear of those dogs never, ever leaves you. But one day, while we were working and trying very hard to work as, as the best we can, the Allies, meaning the, the, the Russians, the British, and the Americans, were getting closer. This was the end of 44. And Germany wanted to hide everything that they had done. There were six extermination camps. All of them were where? In Poland. Auschwitz, Majdanek, Sobibor, Helmel, Belzitz, and Treblinka. They decided to send people out on death marches. They turned out to be death marches in the snow. All the camps were being emptied out. People were sent to concentration camps. They had concentration camps throughout Europe. Even Tunis had a concentration camp. And once again, we were brought to these cattle cars. Cars, railroads, meant for animals. 80 to 100 people were shoved into these cars. Nothing to eat, nothing to drink, and no toilet. And even if you have to, if you don't eat and you don't drink, you still have to go to the bathroom. It was a little pale. How long would a pale last for 80 to 100 people? People soiled themselves. People went mad, they went crazy, they, they, they fainted, they, they vomited, they, they died. It, it was hell on earth. Sometimes the cars, like from Poland, may not have taken so long. Some places could take three days. By the time the cars reached their destination, people were dead. But they were sending us out also. So I went with my father, with my uncle, and the other men, 
until we got to these cattle cars. And there we would cross from Poland to Germany. What did your father realize was about to happen? Well, when we got to Germany, we had to jump down. There were no stairs into the snow. We used the snow to eat it and to drink it and, and to look around who was still there. And there were two other camps besides ours. We were glass factory. There were two others that had men and women. One was woodworking and one was tanning of leather. While we were getting used to this new scene, Germans came on motorcycles and they made announcements, you're taking to camps. My father realized when you go to a camp, you have to get undressed and you have to leave all your things on piles of clo with clothing and with whatever you had. Not that we had anything at that point. My father realized that I couldn't go with them then because if I would get undressed, they would see I'm a girl. He met a school teacher. He gave me a picture of my mother, my father, my two brothers and me. Look at the picture. This woman is a teacher. She, he asked her to take, take an eye, keep an eye on me. She said she would. My father promised, he promised to meet me because the war is going to be over right away. He'll meet me in our hometown in Pietrogon. He promised fathers are supposed to keep their promises. My father didn't keep his promise. I never saw him again. But I did find a train schedule. I did a lot of, lot of research. I found a train schedule and a card that he had to fill out when he got to Buchenwald. That's all I know. He got to Buchenwald. After that, I have no idea what happened to him. I had a new teacher. I don't remember her name. I don't remember what she looked like. But I also don't remember what my real biological mother looked like. We were walking in the snow. Now, when I tell you in the snow, in 1946, when I was adopted by an American family, I had a frozen foot. And my big toe was really big red. They took me to a doctor. The doctor didn't know. He says, looks like a frozen toe. But who has frozen toes in Brooklyn, New York? If you go skiing, if you go skating, you wear proper socks and shoes. I probably was walking in the snow, maybe with rags, maybe with shoes that didn't fit, maybe nothing. I was walking with this woman. She was holding on to me and I was holding on to her in the snow. If somebody sat down because they were so tired, they'd be shot. If somebody fell, they'd be shot. As we went along to Bergen-Belsen, there were bodies and blood and bodies and blood until we finally got to the camp. And when we got to the camp, just the way my father predicted, we had to get undressed and leave everything there. And then we went into the showers. When we came out, we were cold, we were shivering because we were scared, because we were humiliated, because it was so freezing. This woman dared to steal a black coat, and I think she saved my life because she held me, her, her body heat and the coat helped me. Don't know what happened to the coat. I don't know what happened to the woman. But we were in Bergen-Belsen and we went into the barracks. And in the barracks, this was already late and the, uh, the, the bunk beds where six people would sleep at it were already broken down. So we had to sleep on the stone floor with hay and, and, and lice and fleas and rats. Rats and, and lice were eating at us all the time. Rena, can you tell us what happened to that photo that your father had given you? I held on to it, I kissed it, I looked at my mother and my father and my brothers. But when we got to Bergen-Belsen and we had to get undressed, the soldiers came and I was holding something in my hand. Maybe he thought it was a diamond or money, or some valuable. He oh, pried open my hand, and it was just a picture. He must have been very disgusted that it wasn't anything valuable. He tore it up and threw it away. To him, it was garbage. To me, do I look like my mother? Do my children look like my mother or father? Do my grandchildren, do my great-grandchildren, were they tall, were they short? What color eyes did they have? I know nothing about my parents, nothing whatsoever. That picture would have meant a lot to me. I never got another one. We slept on the floor in Bergen-Belsen, and even though we 
had soup once a day, soup made with, it smelled like garbage because it was made out of garbage. And there were some potatoes and potato peels on, on the bottom. And you were lucky to get that. First, when people came in, even from Auschwitz, they said, because people came to Bergen-Belsen from all the different camps because they were sent out of Poland. People said, I, I couldn't taste that soup because it was really awful smelling. But after not eating for a day, it was like getting food from heaven. It was the most important thing. Soup and some sort of old bread. And if somebody died and was holding on to a piece of bread, you would take that piece of bread out of their hand because you were so starved. Um, the rats had plenty to eat for us, and rats really took bites out of people. And of course, the lice, people got typhus. Typhus was rampant every place that you went. And one day, the mother that I had disappeared, but there was another woman whom I don't remember who became my so-called mother. And one day I was very sick with typhus. Everybody was sick and everybody was dying. She died and she died 20 minutes ago and she'll be dead and everybody was gonna die. And somehow or other, I don't know if somebody helped me or I helped myself, go outside of the barracks, because the barracks was so smelly and, and, and impossible. We went outside. It was better to be in the cold than in there. I couldn't move. Typhus is a sickness where you can't see and you can't hear, and everything is just spinning. Something happened that day that never happened before. Soldiers came in, soldiers not like you, but they were soldiers wearing different uniforms than the Nazis, speaking a different language that I didn't understand. And with bullhorns, horns, they made an announcement. We are the British Army. We have come to free you. We brought you food. We brought you medicine. You're free. You can go wherever you want. You can go home. You can go. You can go. Where do I want to go? I don't understand this English that they're speaking. Yiddish was my tongue in the camps. I don't have a mother. I don't have a father. I just lay there. Tell us what happened to you. What was your experience? Well, I was lucky. I was lucky because I was very, very sick. And the soldiers put me on a stretcher, and they took me to a place called Lubick. And from Lubick, there was a boat that took it to Sweden. Sweden had not been at war with Germany. They were neutral, and they were willing to take 6,000 survivors of different Nazi concentration camps and help them in displaced persons camp. They called it alien camp. And I was brought into a camp. I know exactly the name, even though I didn't know how to read, how to write. The war started when I was three and a half. I never went to school. But I went to Bjard. The mother I had left disappeared. I had a new mother, but I was very sick. So I was taken to a hospital in Hasselholm and they treated me very well. They gave me pudding, and they gave me medicine. I met another woman, another mother. Her name was Anna. Anna had a son, Sigmund, and a daughter, Fanny. Fanny was nine and a half years old. She was born in Germany in February. I didn't have a birthday. Fanny died. A lot of people died after the war. Anna's brother had been in the United States, and he sent her tickets for Anna, her son, and her daughter. Somebody had to sponsor you so you wouldn't be a ward of the, of the country, of the United States, and he sent her passports and tickets and affidavits and money. Three tickets. Anna's daughter, Fanny, died, and I had the luck. And Anna asked me, would you like to be my daughter or come with me to America? Well, everybody said how lucky I was that she wanted me. And if I would go to America, from there I could go to Palestine to meet my parents. I got her name, so now my name is Fanny. I got her birthday. I didn't have one of my own and she was dead. She didn't need it. I got the country she was born in, Germany. I told you I was born in Poland. No, I'm born in Germany. I got her birthday and everything about her. My picture was put into a passport. I became that child. And when we came to the United States, mm -hmm. uh, we came to Ellis Island, and I was Anna's daughter, and I came in very, very legally, and Anna's family picked us up, 
and brought us to an apartment, and I started learning English very quickly. All the children say boys, say girls, say chairs, say table. Every day I learned new words. Everything was wonderful, and in the summertime, the people went up to the mountains where there were little bungalows and children went to day camp, and by that time I was getting more American. I learned to go swimming, and I learned to ride a bicycle, and I learned to play Monopoly, and I learned to pick blueberries. Life was wonderful. All the food I wanted, all the drinks, I had a bed to sleep in. But one day, Anna, my new mother, disappeared. It wasn't so bad, because all the women were like mothers to me, and I had plenty to eat, and everything was okay. But a few days later, Anna's family came back, and they were very sad, and they said, Fanny, that was my name, pack up your things, we have to go. I did as I was told, and they took me to a cemetery, and there was one hole, Anna, my new mother, had died. They were burying one person, one person in one little hole. I had never seen that. Everybody was crying except me. I didn't know you're supposed to cry when somebody died. In Bergen Belsen, you just took the body and you threw it out. And if they had something to wear, you took it. If they had something to eat, you took it. Here, one person died and everybody was crying. Maybe they thought I didn't love Anna because I wasn't crying. I wasn't. I didn't know what was happening. And they took us back to sit shiva. Jewish people sit seven days of mourning. And while we were sitting shiva, this family had a problem. I'm always somebody's problem. They brought over a woman who was going to take care of her child. Now that they were, she wasn't there, they really didn't want me. They knew a family in Brooklyn, New York, who had no children. And they called them and they said, maybe you'd like to meet a little orphan girl. Try it. I went there for Shabbat, and they had milk and cookies for me. They also had a little dog. You know how I feel about dogs. I was terrified, but I wasn't going to show them, because maybe they liked the dog better than me. And if they didn't like me, would they send me back some there? Would they send me to an orphanage? Would I be in the street? What would happen to me? Well, I was wrong to think that way. They liked me. And they asked me the same question that had been asked. Would you like to be our daughter? Of course, this time I got a mother and a father. And they said they're going to change my name. My name is started off as Fredja, or Fredel in Yiddish. And then when I was a boy, it was Froyen. And then I became Fanny. And they said, listen, you're not a make-believe Fanny, and you're not a boy anymore. Fredel means joy in English, and joy in Hebrew means Rina. You're going to be our Rina. You're going to be our joy. And that's the name that I stood with. And they were my parents for many, many years. They were my parents. They were my, my husband's in-laws. They were my children's grandparents. And they really gave me a very good life. I had a very good education. I had music lessons. I went traveling. When I got bigger, I, I, young, I, I dated. I met a wonderful husband whom I was married to for 60 years. And we had four children and 22 grandchildren. And as of now, we have 43 great-grandchildren. But we're not finished. We're hoping to get more. And in 1981, there was a gathering of Holocaust survivors. I was living in New York. And my family said, let's go and find out. Maybe somebody else survived. So we came here. And there's a big place called Binyan Ha'uma, where there were people meeting survivors. And we put up signs. I was looking for my parents and for me with all my names. Nobody ever heard of me, and I didn't hear of them. There's a place called Arlson, which is an international tracing bureau. They have lots of information. I wrote to them, and they wrote back to me my name. My name was but Fredja Lichtenstein, proved by no, my parents' names, my brother's names, the ghetto I was in, the camps I was in, that I went to America, that I went to Sweden, case closed, child adopted in America. So it was really amazing to prove that everything that I was thinking, that I wasn't sure was true, was true. And then in 1984, we made Aliyah. We came to live in Israel. And in 89, and I started volunteering in Yad Vashem. I became a guide in the museum there. In 89, Yad Vashem had a trip back to Poland. I was terrified of going back, but my husband encouraged me. And we went back, and I found my home. And I found my real birth certificate. So now I have two birthdays. 
I found my brother's birth certificate, so I know how old I was. I found my parents' marriage license. I found the factory that I lived in. I found the ghetto. I found all these different things, which was very important to me because I wasn't sure that the things I remembered were actual. And now I found that everything was true, and I'm finding more and more things. Even a few weeks ago, I met a, little, a girl who came on birthright, and she was the great-granddaughter of Anna, the woman who brought me to America. So you just never, ever give up. And I think we have to laugh as much as we can, love as much as we can, and thank the, our army and thank the friends of the IDF. We have to be the people who never had a chance to be. And thank God, you can be the future generations. And we're lucky to have you. Rena, thank you so much for telling us your story. Before we allow all the soldiers to ask questions, you guys think if you want to ask Rena some questions, there is one more song that the ensemble would like to sing that is dedicated to all of the mothers that you had who took care of you, who disappeared, who came back. A Yiddish mama. Thank you to the IDF Ensemble. Now we'll take questions from our wonderful soldiers in the audience. Hi, I'm Isaac Shapiro. I'm from the Paratroopers. And I was just wondering, after all the hardships you went through in your life and all the terrible things you went through, if there was a time when you, I would, when you lost faith or you thought, how can God let this happen to me? I think as a child, I didn't know that there was a God. I didn't know that what was happening to me was not normal. As I grew older and as I started thinking about it, and I know that many, there are, half the survivors don't believe in God and half have stayed with religion. I don't understand how God could have allowed this to happen. After all, how many, how many Americans, how many Germans, how many Jews, how many people were killed? I don't understand how God, where God was at this time, but I do know he was watching me because I could not have survived without him. So I believe in him, and I love being Jewish, living in a state, and having God close to me. 
Uh, hello, my name is Yanai, and I'm a commander in Nativ. And I wanted to ask you, what can we do, soldiers and citizens of uh, Medinat Israel, what can we do to remember the Holocaust and pass the, the flame from your generation to the next generation? I think you have to be strong. You have to realize that you're protecting a very important nation, very important people. And then when you get through the army, maybe you should get married and bring more Jewish children into Israel. Hello, my name is Dalia Adams. I'm I wanted to ask you, how was it coming to Israel and move, what, did you move straight to Jerusalem? I should have come in 1945 when I was being sent from, uh, from Sweden. Um, it took me until 1984. Uh, we brought up our children very Zionistic. They belong to B'nai Akiva, which is a, a group of people who push Israel and Aliyah. My husband always wanted to make Aliyah. And every time we came in the summer to look, he looked for an apartment. And I didn't really like the apartments. And then my mother, the last mother that I had, whom I had for many years, heard about this apartment. And it was just perfect. Once we had the apartment, our children said, let's just go. And we came here. We love living here. I miss my husband very much. But I know that this apartment was something he always wanted. And we're close to everything. And all of you are welcome to come visit us, including the FIDF. I'd love to meet you and come to my home. And she means that. I do. She means that because, and I know this, because I deal with seminars at Yad Vashem, and Rina invites every single seminar group that comes to Yad Vashem to come to her house and talk to her. On behalf of all the IDF soldiers from Atif, we want us to thank you so much. It was really inspiring listening to your story. And we even brought you a little present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We want to close out this session by thanking you, Rina, for inviting us into your living room and telling us about your incredible story in the Holocaust, telling us your Zikaron Basalon. And we are all here to make sure that never again really does mean something, that there will never again be another Holocaust. So thank you for tuning into this session of FIDF Live, and we'll see you again next time.